instead of taking this meeting is being recorded all right got it so in the interest of time i can read my points to you if you're ready mm -hmm. jeff hello dick here You should start your PowerPoint, Chuck. Okay, that's what I'm saying. You can hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. All, right, all right, so this documentary by Ken Burns and his colleagues came in three parts. You have an episode called um, The Golden Door, which covers World War I to Kristallnacht in 1938. The second episode is called Yearning to be Free, and that goes from 1938 to 1942, and it covers uh, the period from Kristallnacht to the invasion of the United States, uh, USSR and the beginning of the Holocaust. In episode three, which begins in 1942 and then is left with no ending date, uh, the, the film covers the, rep the topics of refugee rescue, liberation of the death camps, and the fate of the survivors. Um, generally speaking, there's two major issues uh, in this documentary. The first is the issue of accepting more Jewish refugees before the war and uh, later during the war. And um, the Issue of the refugees deals with the question, why didn't the US accept uh, refugees before September 1st, 1939? And then why didn't it do more during the war itself? Uh, implied in the, this discussion is um, a question they actually don't ask, but was the refusal to help the Jews more than happened? Uh, was the refusal to help the Jews mainly because of anti-Semitism or did it also involve acceptance of what were normal practices in the early 20th century, practices of racial segregation, racial persecution, and deportation within nation states? The second major question is the rationale for the American military conflict with Germany. And the film portrays the US involvement in the war as a war defending democracy against fascism. Um, but another question is that maybe given the racial practices within the US, maybe the war was about German uh, territorial expansion threatening Western colonial empires. So that leaves the issue of, of whether the, the main question is, was the US opposing German fascism or German imperialism, or a third possibility is opposing both. Um, to recap some of episode one, which is the, the major issue defining the whole series, uh, the major um, episode defining the whole series. Um, this episode discusses post-World War I growth of xenophobia and the congressional restriction of immigration. But we have a criticism and uh, the criticism is this, that the film fails to provide a full political context for immigration restriction. And that full context would include the history of labor strikes, um, threatening corporate power, the growth of socialist politics and agitation for racial equality. For example, uh, in the year 1919, which is known as the year of the Red Square and also the year of the Red Summer, terms I'll explain in a moment. Uh, Four million workers, 20% of the workforce in the US went on strike across the country. Uh, the US Communist Party was established yeah. in 19. Uh, the African Blood Brotherhood, which was a black socialist group, was established in 19, 1919. And the uh, Bolshevik re regime in 
in uh, Moscow founded the Communist International in that year um, to assist foreign communists in their struggles against capitalism. So you had this, ep this, this atmosphere where the, the workers are on strike, um, blacks and, and socialists are agitating for racial uh, equality and people are talking about, seriously talking about an alternative to capitalism. Um, but Burns and his colleagues treat the uh, main cause of immigration restriction as a diffuse xenophobia among Americans. And uh, our point is that the reality is that xenophobic ideology and the policies associated with that had a definite social location. And that location was in the American upper, upper class fear of an integrated leftist working class comprised of millions of people they regarded as their racial inferiors. It's important to keep in mind in this period of, of xenophobia and nativism that there had developed a view of the Eastern and Southern European immigrants who came into the United States between 1890 and 1910. Uh, the, the view was they weren't really white people. They, were, they weren't black people, they weren't brown people, but they were some kind of in-between mix and they certainly weren't your um, Nordic white people who were the true Americans. And there was this um, fear developed uh, that these people had too many kids and they, they, they didn't uh, work hard and they were racial inferiors who would overwhelm America and destroy it from within. Um, another, uh, so, you know, what, what is happening here is that the upper class with this fear of this potentially revolutionary working class um, engages in the following things. Uh, first, there's a funding of eugenics research. Uh, there's a publication of racist books that advocate restrictions on inferior populations. Uh, at least um, in 1919, there's at least 25 white riots, white racist riots against black people across the country. And that's why it's known as the uh, Red Summer of 1919. Um, and in 1919, Congress creates the American Legion. You might say, so what? They create a veterans organization. But this American Legion is designed to promote Americanism and to use veterans to fight uh, workers who engage in, in, in strikes against their companies. It's also in this year that you have the Attorney General, uh, Mr. Palmer, engage in raids that rounded up leftist immigrants and uh, threw them out of the United States. Um, so uh, what we have, oh, well, we also have uh, the restrictive immigration laws by 1924. Um, finally, we have another criticism, and that is that in discussing the rise of the Nazis to power in uh, 1933, uh, episode one fails to point out the connection of uh, German capitalism to Nazi fascism. Um, the German corporate class faced two major problems. One is they had an insubordinate working class full of communists and socialists that threatened to disrupt profits through labor strikes. Secondly, they had lack of access to uh, global markets. The, the Germans were the last big industrial power to, um, to come online, so to speak, to, to be fully industrialized. And by then the US, Britain and France had pretty much divvied up the world um, and the Jap uh, excuse me, the, the Germans, and I could add the Japanese were squeezed out. And um, since capitalism is this expansion, expansionist system that must continually grow, uh, the German uh, corporate class was in a, a very bad position. Uh, so Hitler's Nazis promised solutions. First, they would eliminate the communists, the socialists, and the independent trade unions. 
Uh, and the communists, uh, they linked to anti-Semitism because they said the communists were Jews and the Jews were Bolsheviks. So um, the Jews had a double stigma. One, they were, they were not Germans, they were not Christians, and worse, they were communists. A second solution promised by Hitler was the military seizure of living space to expand the German economy. And this was the idea behind his motto that Germany must march to the east. So coming back to the United States, uh, the pre-World War II situation in the 1930s was, was this, that uh, the situation that influences U.S immigration restriction and U.S. refugee policy towards Jews seeking to leave Europe. There's four things to take into account. One thing is the anti-Semitism within the United States. The second thing is American precedents that actually inspired Nazi ideology and practices. Mm -hmm. A third thing is American admiration for certain Nazi policies that would make it, as we could say, kind of soft on the Nazis. And a fourth thing to consider is inherent affinities between American liberal democracy and German fascism. So let me cover each one of those four points. Um, Anti-Semitism in the US, it was not as bad as in Europe, certainly not as bad as in Germany, but it was still present widespread and actually, according to historians, growing from 1910 through the 1940s. And you can see it in certain uh, concrete examples. Um, residential segregation, um, maybe informal, but it existed. Uh, there was social and professional exclusion, exclusion from social clubs, a uh, practice that continued for many years after World War II, professional exclusion, uh, exclusion from things like universities. I once had a professor at UCLA, uh, a, a, dear, a dear guy who was um, actually from the East Coast, his name was Gene Levine. And one day in talking to him in his office, he, he said to me, <coughs> He said that before World War II, the University of California was Judenrein, free of Jews. Now, I never mm. checked out the veracity of his statement, but uh, I took it that uh, he should know. And, um, but this gives you an idea of um, the practices that existed within the US. Also, there were admissions quotas, especially in the Ivy League colleges, to minimize the number of Jewish college students. Um, because this was the bet these these Ivy League schools were the bastion of white Anglo-Saxon Protestant um, education and it was producing the future leaders of America and um, here you have all these competitive kids coming out of New York City and other East Coast cities and um, you know it's like wait a minute what's going on here this this is a waspy institution what are we doing with the Hebrews here um, to use their term of the time. Um, there was also in the 1930s a widespread and continuous anti-Semitic propaganda. You probably heard of Father Coughlin, Henry Ford. Um, Father Coughlin, by 1938, had 29 million monthly radio listeners. Um, there was the growth of anti-Semitic fascist organizations, the Ku Klux Klan, the Silver Shirts, and America First. And at least four million Americans joined my the groups. Yeah. In I mean, if you want to pick up mine, that's fine. But what is it? It's just uh, eloquence. Um, there Chuck, was Chuck. Yeah. Forgive me, Chuck. This is Rick. I think you need to tell everybody else to please mute themselves because you're getting interrupted. I'm sorry to also interrupt you. Okay, no problem. Like, okay, so people hit that mute button, please. Maybe um, the host can mute everybody. Usually that's possible. Okay, just don't mute me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, also, and this, this is rather horrifying, uh, rather is an understatement. This is it's actually quite horrifying. Fortune Magazine in 1939 conducted a poll 
uh, regarding Jews in the United States. And they had a statement in the poll that said Jews should be deported to some new homeland as fast as it can be done without inhumanity. Apparently, 13 million Americans agreed to that poll, to that statement. Um, so this is the, the atmosphere of, of anti-Semitism in the US and um, unnerving, um, scary, and you know, give rise to a lot of uh, questioning, like what is our, you know, if you're Jewish, what is your position here in the United States? What, you know, should you, should you speak up or should you keep your head down and be quiet and, and hopefully this will all go away? Um, is you know, very dangerous and unsettling uh, atmosphere. Um, besides the growth of anti-Semitism in the United States, another thing to consider with regard to US uh, refugee policies is that, um, and, and here we come to, to the issue of the American leadership having a certain um, affinity uh, with the German fascism. Um, one set of, pre one precedent that was admired by the Nazis was what we can call settler colonialism. This involves the acquisition of living space through military conquest, the removal of inferior indigenous peoples through savage racial warfare, uh, military tactics of starvation of the indigenous peoples through crop destruction, massacres of non-combatants and destruction of entire villages, forced marches of exile with death rates between 25 and 50 percent, and containment of the surviving inferiors within restricted areas, otherwise known as reservations. And then the repopulation of the conquered territory with the quote unquote superior race. Um, another American precedent admired by the Nazis was white race nationalism. American laws enforced white political superiority and protected whites from contamination by racial inferiors. These laws denied full citizenship rights to people of color. For example, in 1938, only 4% of blacks successfully had voting rights. Uh, prohibited interracial marriages. The laws de denied immigration rights to those identified as racial inferiors. And 17, st 17 states, which is one third of the United States, because the US at the time had only 48 states. 17 states mandated segregation in housing, employment, and schooling. Uh, another precedent, oh, continuing along with this white race nationalism, American laws enforced white political superiority and protected whites from the quote unquote contamination by racial inferiors with other laws that justified the forced removal of millions of Americans and Mexican Americans from the US. At least 1 million were deported in the 1930s. Uh, the US permitted de facto slave labor through the practice of convict leasing, which involved hard labor from sunup to sundown, torture and starvation diets. And the US uh, authorities permitted murderous pogroms, white riots and assassinations through lynchings and bombings and shootings, often involving local authorities. Um, there's still more precedents admired by the Nazis. One was, another one was race betterment, what they called race betterment science. We now call it eugenics. And this was a way of the upper class uh, justifying their policies uh, against the working class. They said these, these immigrants are really, they're not exploited like they claim, they're just racial inferiors they're incapable of any serious achievement. And so upper class families poured a lot of money into what they called race betterment research by white supremacist scientists to look for ways to control the spread of what they called racial degeneration. 
and numerous states enacted laws to involuntarily sterilize people they called the morally unfit and the criminally insane. California was a leader in the sterilization program. German scientists had their own eugenic studies, but they also paid close attention uh, to the American research. Um, the Americans, or rather the Germans, uh, also devoured the um, racist books put out by um, Americans. Um, Adolf Hitler, when he was in prison, read Madison Grant's The Passing of the Great Race. And um, years later, he wrote to Grant praising the book, describing it as his Bible. He read it while he was writing Mein Kampf. Uh, the Nazi racial theory read uh, the book by the American Ku Klux Klan member, Lothrop Stoddard. The book was called The Revolt Against Civilization, The Menace of the Underman. And the concept of the underman was those people in the population who were just racial inferiors and, and they would never really fully adapt to modern civilization. The Germans, the Nazis took this concept of the underman and um, inserted it into their racial ideology as the, the Untermensch or the Untermenschen. Um, another precedent uh, adopted by the Nazis was the uh, sterilization law. In 1933, the Reichstag passed a law for the prevention of hereditarily diseased offspring. It was patterned on American anti-Semite Harry Laughlin's model sterilization law of 1922. Uh, the Nuremberg Law of 1935 that created a racial basis for German citizenship was modeled on American laws. The Nuremberg Law of 1935 that mandated, um, uh, excuse me, prohibited um, miscegenation to protect German blood was based on US laws and um, other laws that created second class citizenship uh, were, were modeled on American laws. Um, so now flipping this, besides the Nazis admiring the Americans and, and using American practices uh, as models for their their policies, there was American admiration. And by, when I say American, I don't mean everybody in the country, but I mean, there's a, a solid demographic, um, most of it located uh, in the American upper class. There's an American uh, admiration for Nazi policies. Um, here are the Nazi policies that many Americans found um, admirable. Um, there was a thorough elam elimination of communist and socialist as political forces in Germany. There was the destruction of independent trade unions, repression of gays as social degenerates, promotion of motherhood as a woman's defining role, white supremacy, anti-Semitism, militaristic nationalism, privatization of select government services, and expressed intent to destroy the Soviet Union. And on my slide, it ends with a question, are any of these values popular in the United States today? I don't answer that just yet. Um, the last three slides here, uh, before I turn it over to Dick, um, they're entitled, After the War, the Fascism We Forget, the Imperialism We Don't See. And, Here's a question for you. Uh, did the incorporation of American practices into German political life make Germany more democratic or more fascist? These fascist aspects of the US were developed long before Americans even formed pro-Nazi organizations, long before there was a Henry Ford, a Father Coughlin, or a Charles Lindbergh. If these American practices were called fascist when they're used by the Nazis, here's a rhetorical question for you. Why aren't they called fascist when they're used by the Americans who pioneered them ahead of the Germans? Next slide, after the war, the fascism we forget. 
it took more than 20 years. Let me let me begin again. The United States fights a war for ostensibly for democracy and against fascism. Yet it took more than 20 years after World War II for the United States to eliminate the legal scaffolding of fascist policies here in the United States. In 19, it's in 1948, racial segregation in the armed forces was banned. 1954, school segregation declared unconstitutional. 1964, Civil Rights Act outlawed discrimination by race, religion, sex, and national origin. 1965, the Voting Rights Act outlawed racial discrimination in voting. And it's not until 1967, when many of us were in college, that the Supreme Court struck down laws that prohibited interracial marriage, declaring such laws unconstitutional. And enforcement of many of these legal decisions has often remained weak to this day. And it was up until the mid to late 60s that the fascist death squads of the KKK, the Ku Klux Klan, continued to operate with impunity, with the perpetrators of murders um, not even being brought to justice. Uh, last slide. Almost immediately after the war, the upper class in the United States began campaigns to first destroy the political power of workers. You can go read the Taft-Hartley Act of 1947 regarding that point take control of labor unions by purchasing, uh, purging the radical workers, uh, remove communists from political life within America and destroy communists abroad whenever possible. Perhaps the accepted view of America as a democracy opposing Nazi fascism is just plain wrong. A better perspective might be that America is a politically mixed society, democracy for some, fascism for others, freedom for some and repression for others. And I think that brings us to the second issue of our talk um, regarding the war and um, US sympathy for fascism. So I'm going to thank you for your time. Sorry, I didn't get my slides up, Jeff and all. And um, it's you, the floor is over to you, Richard. I'm trying to unmute. Okay, let me try to share a screen. Let me try again. Okay, does everybody see my PowerPoint now? Yeah, it's at the last slide. Okay, uh, let me go to the first slide. Okay. Okay. Uh, the first. Okay, I think we. If it's working, the first thing I want to do is, as I look over uh, the list of people who have logged on, I see someone from Thailand. Hi, Jack. I see someone from China, Barry, and I see my sister in New York. Hello, Sally. So, uh, Jack, uh, someone asked if the conditions that Chuck has described applied in Canada. So when we get into Q&A, maybe you can answer that question, since Jack is originally from Vancouver. OK. Uh, there were three things that, I, that happened to me, and my sister will probably remember some of these, that really made this uh, documentary, which I encourage people to see. I have the link here, and I have the link at the end. Three things that happened when I was in, in, in uh, growing up. The first thing was uh, I witnessed hundreds of people every day standing up saying the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. And I had by then in the early 60s seen a lot of documentary films about Nazi Germany. And all I could do is think, well, what's the difference between raising your right hand or putting your right hand on your Hard if you're if you're raising it to a swastika or if you're raising it to a flag, and I've never forgotten that moment, and I was reminded of it the other day. Uh, the other thing is, uh, in where I grew up, the city's chief librarian 
had been an investigator at the Nuremberg trials. As a young man, he grew up in Europe and he spoke French and German. And he once told me, he said, well, he watched uh, people for the different war trials. And he said, the war trials in the Soviet zone were very quick, but uh, people, got, there was a lot more justice. And that has stuck with me. And the third thing is uh, I read a, I read about a man named O. John Rogie. If people have heard uh, uh, the the podcast Ultras, you know about John Rogie. He was a uh, prosecutor for the Justice Department during World War II. And his responsibility was to track all the American companies that were in cahoots with the Nazis. And that continued throughout the war, like General Motors, Ford, and stuff like that. They were building tanks and building uh, rocket help but well, they didn't build with the rockets, but a lot of the armaments that the Germans built were built by American companies. And John Rogge tried to prosecute these people when the war ended and the attorney general, Tom Clark, fired him in 1946. He then went on a speaking tour. And once when I was in New York, I looked John Rogge up in the phone book, I found him and I talked to him and he didn't talk very long, but he told me that his report that was purged uh, and uh, uh, before that he wrote before he was fired was eventually published as a book called The Official German Report. And you can find that. And this will identify all of the American companies that continued to support the Nazis, even into World War II. And uh, one of the conclusions I have from these childhood experiences is that you can't explain bigotry genocide and fascism just as something that happens from bad attitudes. These are policies, governmental policies, and they come down. Attitudes come from the, the policies. It isn't that the policies come from the attitudes. So when I looked at this PowerPoint, I uh, thought of the, and I did a lot of research afterwards, there were a number of points that came out. Uh, there's a wonderful book called The Nazi Next Door by Eric Lichtblau. He used to be a reporter for the New York Times. He documents that about 10,000 Nazis were admitted to the United States. And these included about 1,000 Nazi intelligent officers. Some were admitted to the United States, some stayed in Germany, some were kept kind of as sleeper cells in East, in East Bloc countries and they were used to foment opposition beginning in 1953 in the Ukraine against the Soviet Union. Also, there were 1,600 Nazi scientists who were recruited and they moved, to Al they moved to the United States. They mostly ended up in Alabama, but at the beginning they were in New York. And Jewish GIs, since there were many who spoke German, they were German Jewish refugees, were put in charge of bringing these Nazi scientists to department stores so they could look like Americans. Must have been quite a job. Uh, the other thing is and, uh, that the CIA supported Nazi and neo-Nazi groups in Central and Eastern Europe from 45 to the date. Mostly, and the, most of these were in the Ukraine. And there's lots, somebody is putting, has their mic on, they have to put their mic off, please. Put your mics off. Okay, so the, uh, the, the groups are Svoboda, uh, right sector. Uh, Svoboda was, uh, we, can go, we can go into that if you want, but these were groups that were cultivated from immediately in the, uh, in the war. In fact, uh, John, uh, Alan Dulles, who was the, became the head of the uh, CIA, met with a Nazi general in Switzerland in early 1945, that was six months before the end of the war, to make sure that he would be able to recruit uh, these Nazi spies who were experts, so, so to speak, on the Soviet Union. And another point is that the US government has, author has supported many authoritarian, they use this term, governments in many parts of the world. So they don't use the word fascist. Sometimes they'll say military dictatorships, totalitarian or authoritarian. But they are fascist governments. And the other point, which I got from Eric Lichtblau, and I've been aware of since there's been a lot of articles in the press lately, is the US government has continued to support, or that it's been indifference to many 19, post-1945 genocides and refugees. And the refugee crises have continued right up to this day. 
And for instance, my wife and I had a refugee who was from Eritrea. She had to go to the Sudan. From the Sudan, she had to fly across Africa to uh, Nigeria, I'm not sure where she flew. Then she flew to Brazil. She had to make it from Brazil to Colombia. She had to be a, a hire a coyote to go up the Darien Gap to get from, uh, from uh, Colombia all the way to Panama. From Panama, she took buses to the United States. And at the United States, she was incarcerated in one of these private, privately owned refugee jails. And eventually she was able to get a lawyer through a guy named Brother John, uh, who helped uh, refugees from, uh, from uh, uh, all over the world, especially from uh, Eritrea. And the only way she could survive was because she got a job in the kitchen where she could eat, eat peanut butter. So this, this is not so, the, the, the issue of refugees and spurning refugees is not something new. This is something that has continued to this very day. Uh, let me talk a little bit about uh, the uh, US military interventions. Uh, the, the following map, which I'll show shows uh, U.S. foreign military interventions between 1945 and 2003, and the reason I say this is because the 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 uh, the documentary, as good as it is, and I recommend people see it, never mentions U.S. foreign policy. U.S. foreign policy is not an issue. They talk about uh, the Immigration Act of 1964. Uh, Congressman Sellers from New York was a big advocate of it, beginning in World War II. And even that, would, that Immigration Act, which ended the national origins feature of immigration to the United States, was not able to have any section that dealt with refugees. Uh, the other thing is that the US has sponsored many proxy wars, which support right-wing governments. Uh, that includes Chile, Yemen, the Ukraine, which is ongoing right now, Israel, Palestine, Ethiopia, Lebanon, Angola, East Timor, Paraguay, and Syria, and probably many others. Uh, the International Criminal Court, and here's a picture of it over here in The Hague, was established in 1998, 1998 through the Treaty of Rome. And as of, as of 2023, the United States has refused to join. And this became an issue just last week when uh, the Secretary of Defense overruled the White House. And he says, no, we cannot have, we cannot try to prosecute any Russians for their activity in the Ukraine because that'll leave American soldiers and American officials subject to prosecution from the International Criminal Court for their own war crimes. So this is a continuing issue. Uh, this is a map uh, that I found, and these were uh, U.S. military interventions stopped in 19, in 2020, in 2003. So since then, there have been nearly 20 years more of uh, military interventions like Afghanistan and so forth. Uh, the, uh, since uh, 20, 2003, the U.S. military interventions, some of which were really bloody, included uh, Iraq, where over a million people died, especially when the United States bombed all the sewage facilities and dropped uh, radi or used radi radi radiation of shells that had radiation in them, Afghanistan, Libya, Syria, Pakistan, and Somalia. And, the, and I mentioned the, the proxy wars. And we should also mention that the, the budget for all of this has full bipartisan support, and it's now approaching $900 billion a year. And if you look at other government agencies other than the Department of Defense, like this like Department of State or Department of Energy, the, the actual military security budget of the United States is $1.4 trillion. And there's over 800 military, foreign military bases. So these are, these are I'm not sure what happened there. Okay, uh, another thing that we should consider is that uh, the policy of the United States is not just direct interventions, it's also supporting and sponsoring color revolutions. Uh, and the color, there have been over 33, according to the Wikipedia, over 33 color revolutions. Here's a map of where the color revolutions have taken place. And they've been involved in some of the countries, including the Philippines, Yemen, Czechoslovakia, which is now the Czech Republic and the Slovak Republic, 
Tunisia, Poland, Egypt, Iran, Iraq, Ukraine, and Kazakhstan. Ukraine was 2004. And the Iran was called the, 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 green, the green Revolution. Each one has a different color. Uh, the other <clears throat> thing is, uh, uh, when I was a graduate student, when I first met Chuck, uh, this was at UCLA, I had a class from Leo Cooper, who was an expat from South Africa. And he pointed then, so that was over 40 years ago, that there were more people had died in genocides since World War II than took place in World War II. In World War II, there were 6 million Jews and 5 million non-Jews. And the non-Jews included uh, gypsies, Sinta, which is a group related to the gypsies, and included many political prisoners, communists, socialists, and labor leaders, and homosexuals. Uh, since World War II, I found one chart that says there have been over 89 major genocides, and some, especially Indonesia, which we studied in this class I had in genocide, over a million people died. And this was political. These were mostly members of the Communist Party who were in certain provinces that had were opposed to the government where they were assassinated. And this, this genocide was directly linked to the US government. And uh, another one, I have this picture over here. This is Rwanda, which we studied in this class. Uh, over a million people died in this genocide. Here's a picture of it. And the Clinton administration, following the advice of Secretary of State Madeleine Albright, refused to intervene. And it turns out Madeleine Albright was descended from uh, Czech Jews who had fled the country and hid their Jewish identity in response to the Holocaust. She had no idea of that. Uh, and other, other things that I found, and probably other people will have many other things, the George H.W. Bush administration, that is George Bush, the father, did nothing to stop the Serbian crimes against Bosnians and Croatian Muslims in the former Yugoslavia. And uh, we also talked of another thing is uh, the Obama administration pursued violent regime change in Libya through NATO. This resulted in a mob murdering the country's leader, Muammar, Muammar Gaddafi, created a failed state which, with rival uh, warlords, and it killed an estimated 250,000 people, another type of genocide. So the list of genocides goes on. Here's one map. I don't think the maps are very good. They, most of the maps are before 1991 that I could find, and they uh, have a real Cold War bias to them. But it, this one does have Indonesia with 1.2. It has Rwanda, Burundi. It has a lot of things in Africa that we studied. Uh, and it also has Guatemala, which was engineered by the United States, uh, El Salvador, Chile, and Argentina. So this is a sample of all the genocides that have many of many of which have happened, like Turkey. Uh, well, well, Turkey, the Armenians in Turkey was at the time of World War One, but most of these were after World War Two. Uh, <clears throat> I mentioned uh, the book by uh, Eric Lichtblau, the New York Times correspondent, which is really good for if you want to learn more about the Nazis who were recruited and made, made it into the, the United States. Uh, he says that they came in, th in three broad categories. There were the Nazi scientists who were not just rocket scientists, but they were also physicians and doctors who had helped uh, uh, the Nazi not the Nazi space program, but the Nazi, the Luftwaffe. And so these people became uh, doctors who worked for the Air Force to make sure that uh, US pilots would be able to benefit from all of the research that the Nazis had done for their own pilots. It also included uh, many Nazis and collaborators who mixed in with uh, immigrants from captive nations and 40% of the refugees who were allowed into the United States after the war came from Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia, where in Latvia and Lithuania, these were where the local police forces uh, heavily collaborated with the Nazis. And if you go to these countries now, you discover that uh, they have rehabilitated most of the uh, Nazi collaborators, at least the ones who stayed rather than coming to the United States. Uh, and while some were in the uh, spotlight, like, like Werner von Braun, I remember many 
uh, the Walt Disney show. I remember seeing him many times. He was extremely well known and, uh, but many stayed out of the uh, limelight. And it turns out that most of these Nazi scientists had worked at a, a Nazi lab and factory in Nordhausen, which was next to once of the concentration camps. And they used, they built, they, they designed and built the B-1 and the B-2 rockets, but they built them with slave labor. Uh, not so much Jewish slave labor, but uh, prisoners of war. And only a tiny percentage, I think, of these of 1600 Nazi scientists were ever prosecuted. And I think maybe maybe just one, Alfred Rudolph, and, and to avoid prosecution, he, he, he self-deported and he moved back to Germany in the 1980s. Uh, another thing to realize is that the use of these uh, Nazi uh, spies and Nazi intelligence officers began early. It began before the end of the war. As I mentioned in my introduction, Alan Dulles, who spoke German, met with a Nazi general in Switzerland while the war was still on to ne negotiate the transfer of many of these Nazi intelligence agents to, who would, so they would continue to spy on the Soviet Union. And then they would also promote anti-Russian independence movements in Eastern Europe. And the most notorious of this was in the Ukraine in 1953, when the US dropped some of the air dropped some of these people and they were immediately caught and executed. But this has continued. So you, you can see that what is going on in the Ukraine now has roots that go back to the uh, all the way to World War II. Uh, and another great source for information on this is called the National Security Archive, where they use the Freedom of Information Act to, uh, to get uh, US documents, US documents that had been uh, uh, been in, uh, that were not, were not public. And uh, they have been able to get many of these released CIA documents uh, published and the, about the use of the spies. And I found the two, uh, two were particular uh, interesting. The, the, one, the one that was Reinhard Galen. Reinhard Galen was the Wehrmacht's, head of the Wehrmacht spying efforts Wehrmacht was the German army in World War I on, on the Eastern Front, which is where most German soldiers died and where most of the fighting in World War II took place. Reinhard Galen insisted that his uh, spies would become a separate entity. And then Reinhard Galen became the uh, head of West German intelligence. The, I, I don't have his name here, but another person was uh, the, uh, who became the head of uh, the NATO's military effort. He had been a prominent Nazi. And then the Nazi collaborators who assisted Germany in the Holocaust have been honored and rehabilitated in many Eastern European countries. And when I did my research, this includes Estonia, the Ukraine. Uh, many people have heard of Stefan Bandera. He was uh, the leader of the organization of uh, Ukrainian nationalists. He was uh, the, the political grandfather of most of the groups that are active like Svoboda and, and so forth, right, right sector in the Ukraine. Also Latvia, Romania, Lithuania, Serbia, Poland, and Croatia. And local apologists say, well, we're not honoring them because they were Nazi collaborators and they assisted in the Holocaust, which is absolutely true, only because they were anti-communist, which is also true. But the critics have pointed out that uh, their, anti, their hostility to the Soviet Union became irrelevant after 1991. But these people have been honored in all of, in all, in all of these governments since 1991. The, uh, Let's see, we, all, we already talked about this, the Nazi scientist. This is a picture of Werner von Braun, who many people know. And uh, uh, I, I guess we've already gone over this. Um, uh, this, a little bit more about the uh, support of the, of the uh, 
Nazi, Nazi and neo-Nazi groups in Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, the, uh, the, the Nazi who I was trying to remember, his name is Adolf Heusinger. He had been the chief of the Wehrmacht's general staff and he became the head of NATO's military committee and served in that role from 1961 to 1964. So we can see that the, the US uh, use of these ex-Nazis or former Nazis is extensive and has continued for, uh, up until the 60s at least. And uh, this is a point that Eric Lichtblau makes and I think it's very good. We all remember the border wall and the Muslim ban from the Donald Trump era, but this is re re basically continuing the same policies that barred Jewish victims of the Holocaust in the United States. And this didn't, didn't, exi didn't exist only in the 1930s, even according to the Ken Burns documentary, these policies continued through the 1950s. As I mentioned before, the 19, Emanuel Sellers 1965 immigration bill, which changed the national origins quotas, never covered refugees. There's never been any official policy regarding refugees. And the, the anti-refugee policies have remained the same, only the barred groups have changed. Now they're until a few years ago, they were mostly from Syria, Iraqi, Iraq, and Afghanistan. Now they're mostly from Central America. And the largest group barred from refugee status in the United States now originates in Latin America, many of whom have died. And this is just from the Wall Street Journal from, I think, uh, two days ago, when they attempt to cross the Darien Gap, which is, in, uh, is through uh, Colombia and, and uh, Panama. And they die when they're trying to cross the Rio Grande uh, River to get from Texas, from Mexico into Texas. And then we should also remember the uh, DACA program, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. Uh, it has left 600,000 dreamers in the lurch. These are the children of people who were not legally admitted to the United States, but they have birthright citizenship in the United States. So that's a brief summary of all of the efforts that were all of the things that uh, Ken Burns should have included in his documentary and left out. And uh, for those who haven't seen the documentary, I have a link over here that you can go. So I think that's it. I think we're gonna, that's about one hour altogether. We're gonna open up uh, our uh, presentations now to all kinds of questions from the audience. So Jeff, do you wanna uh, coordinate the, uh, Yeah, do you yeah, do you hear me? Yeah. Do you hear me? Yeah, I hear you. Okay. Uh can you hear me? My hand is raised. <laughs> Joan, we can hear you, but you, you're not called on yet. I'm gonna ask the first question. Uh and and I'm gonna ask you point out, Dick, that there's the US has done lots of uh uh military actions in countries all over the world. And then you give us a long list of places where there were atrocities and the US did nothing to help. Uh, so I'm kind of confused. Are you advocating for the US not to interfere in other countries, which I guess is what you mean when you when you give us this list of-, of Well, the, uh, the point of the- uh of the Burns documentary is that the U.S. could have uh, could have rescued, could have done things to rescue the people who were victims of genocide, and it points out that the uh, the the that the U.S. did everything it could to make sure that the minimal national origins quotas were not filled. It wasn't until 1944 that the United States finally changed its policies and assisted. So I don't think you need to have a direct military intervention. And like Vietnam, where three million people were killed by the U.S. bombing, to say that you should admit refugees, if re refugees are re refugees should be admitted independent of the cause. And if the cause happens to be United States action, that's too bad. But it doesn't mean that you shouldn't. And it, I, I, so I'm not sure. In other words, I'm not saying that you should go around the world to create refugees and then admit them. But if 
if refugees are created, you should admit them. Absolutely. And I'm, this is a point that Eric, Eric Licklau uh, makes. He says that the policies that barred the refugees of Nazism <clears throat> from entering the United States have continued. He, when he g gave this talk, it was mostly people from Syria, but now it's mostly people from Latin America. And it's bipartisan at this point. It isn't, I guess my point is it's not strictly a Jewish issue. This is a humanitarian issue that should affect all people. And the United States should be willing to accept these refugees. They shouldn't have, like the woman who stayed at our house, they shouldn't have to take flights all over the world and try to go through the Darien Gap and take buses through Mexico and end up in a, in a private sector detention center to be able to, uh, to, to apply for asylum in the United States. If it's Jeff, you you want to call in more people? Well, Joan? my hand is raised. Yeah, I'm calling on you, Joan. I see your hand. You didn't have to tell me. Just just ask your question. Okay. Um, great presentation, Chuck. I have one question. In all the uh, fascist uh, events that were taking place before World War II in the United States, were there any, was there any movement against them? Was there a movement to try to get the Jews who had been brought over by ship and were refused to uh, land? Was there any kind of protest or demonstrations about that? Were there people who were saying, we need to let them in? What, you know, from, our point of view, what was there anything happening? Okay, um, the answer is yes, 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 and yes. Uh, there was wherever you find, well, I won't say wherever, that's too absolute, but quite as a general rule, wherever you find people oppressed, oppressed, and repressed, um, you're going to find opposition, you know, people fighting for their dignity, for their freedom. Uh, for justice, um, you know, in the United States uh, uh, during the era of, of Jim Crow, which lasts just about a century after the Civil War. There were numerous groups, uh, black and sometimes interracial, uh, fighting against Klan, uh, fighting to organize workers, fighting for protection of black families, uh, fighting to change the laws. Um, there was opposition in the, in the case of uh, anti-Semitism in the, uh, especially in the 20th century after World War I, um, there were not only groups among Jews, particularly East European Jews with uh, Yiddish speaking organizations in the, in the labor movement and organizations that were often quite revolutionary, um, you know, against capitalism. Um, uh, there was uh, one of the problems for the, for the upper class in the United States was that you had the growth of socialist and communist movements uh, in the United States and the Communist Party in the United States, um, in spite of all the historical mistakes it, it, it made on its own um, did many good things uh, and one of, one of them was it, it was the only white dominant by white dominant I mean numerically dominant with whites the, it's the only numerically dominant white organization that fought uh, for uh, racial equality and it put its money where its mouth is. And there's an interesting section in the uh, Ken Burns documentary where he, he talks about some of this opposition to the Nazis and he shows an American um, merchant marine sailor um, pull down the swastika on a German ship, the Bremen. And, um, but what he doesn't say, and I, th I think this is indicative of Ken Burns policies, he doesn't tell you that that guy, his name was Bill Bailey, and um, he was he joined the Merchant Marine in 1914, and and he was a guy who really 
detested uh, injustice. And he found an organization that he thought fought against that, put its money where its mouth, uh, its mouth, its money where its mouth is. And that was the Communist Party. And so the guy who pulls down the swastika on the ship, uh, this fellow Bill Bailey, is a, is a member of the uh, United States Communist Party. But it wouldn't have taken too much effort to report that. And I, I think that Burns not saying that I'd be surprised if that's an accidental over, oversight. Um, and, uh, you know, there's, you had a lot of activity pushing back against uh, injustice in all kinds of areas of the labor movement, um, the fights against the, uh, the, the fascist Ku Klux Klan and its death squads. So there are plenty of organizations and, um, you know, if you need a reading list, let me know. Uh, oh, okay, Ori. <laughs> Whoops. Jeff, you've got two screens up. You're probably interfering. <laughs> I have two screens. Tony, do you hear this? I can hear you fine, but you've got two screens. Yeah, and you're yeah. probably, my, you're my, probably... my microphone's messed up. Can you please uh, be the host for the rest okay. of this session? You're, All right. you're, you're good now, Jeff. OK. Well, I think Uri had his hand up. So Uri. Can't hear you, Uri. I think Uri is. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? We, we do. Can you? Yes, yes. we do. Oh, yes, okay. we can. OK. So. First of all, thank you, Chuck, and thank you, Dick. You added a lot of uh, pointers to the, the whole thing that I watched with, with, with the Burns thing, with a lot of enthusiasm. It really uh, gave me a lot of perspective since I wasn't born in this country. A uh, couple of things, couple of comments on this thing, really. Uh, somewhere along the line, when I came to this country, I wanted to believe that... Uh, the Dr. Jekyll and Dr. Hyde, the good guys won. Apparently, since the inception of this country, there is always the fight. And what my observation is, the cynical thing always wins. So when the United States after 45 drafted all these Nazis to work for us against the Russians, it was not because we love them or anything else. It's because it was altruistic. So the United States talk very nice game about all the nice things that the American Constitution provides to the world. However, when you check the realities, like Dick mentioned, we are sure we fall very short of it. In other words, we we would like to believe that we are nice people. We're not. We have a better propaganda than most people, and we can definitely convince most of the people in the United States we are the nice guys. The other day, it's 20 years since we invaded Iraq. Why? We wanted to get the, the oil. So this is one point that we have to take into consideration that this, this country for 250 years at least has been fighting between the good and the bad, if you want to put it this way, the Jekyll Hyde conversation. And another comment about refugees. I think that the situation is going to get a whole lot worse because of the climate. So uh, the conversation would be really how many refugees the rest of the world, the, the what we call the, the Western world or the economically advanced world is willing to accept from the people who are going to be ravaged because the climate change is going to create a famine across Africa, just a matter of time. So we're gonna run into this issue even, even without Trump and without the wall and without, don't want the Mexicans and all the Latinos and Honduras and Guatemala and all this into this country. 
because it's going to happen and see what's happening in Europe. The, the French and the Italians and the, even the Swedes are against all the refugees. So this is an issue that is a whole lot systemic. And I don't think that the United States is willing or ready to actually have a serious conversation based on the, the nice US constitution or the Emma Lazarus thing that is on the, inscribed on the, on the Statue of Liberty in, in the port of New York. We, are, we talk nice. But when we check the activity of the Americans, and I'm proud American, don't misunderstand me. I think we fall short, way short of what we say. So thank you. <clears throat> but I'm going to give a quick comment. Uh, it's, it might it would be use, interesting for people to watch the Why We Fight series. This was prepared by Frank Hopper during World War II to motivate American soldiers. And it's clear that the, uh, the line is we're opposed to totalitarianism. We're, we're here to protect democracy, kind of liberal interventionism. But this was for public consumption. And if you look at US foreign policy, you'll, you'll find that a concern to implement democracy is very low, very low priority. I mean, this group follows events in Israel, Palestine very closely. I mean, Israel has become an apartheid state. Uh, Egypt, which is a total dictatorship at this point, uh, with tons of people jailed for opposition to the government, gets worth three billion dollars a year in weapons from the United States, Saudi Arabia, and the list goes on. So this is, you know, we have to realize that the good guy argument, that, you know, you can. This is this is a this is a propaganda tool, but it doesn't have much to guide U.S. foreign policy. That would be my analysis of what you're talking about. I'd like. I'd like to throw in a comment here, and uh, I, I, I want to offer a, a framework for dealing with these issues. And this takes me back to um, the relationship between German capitalism and German fascism. And I said earlier, German capitalism in the early 30s had two problems. One was it needed to restore profits, but it was always up against the um, opposition of, of German workers who, who were very much left-leaning, quite willing to call strikes, uh, to um, shut down production, to compel their employers to raise their wages. And for, for the capitalists, this, this had to end, um, especially because they're in the middle of a depression, a global depression. Um, secondly, the uh, the German upper class needed more markets and the Nazis promised to march to the east. So the Nazis promised to destroy the labor movement, which it did, get rid of the leftists, which it did, and uh, march to the east to um, you know, make, make uh, the western part of the Soviet Union the, the, uh, uh, the equivalent, the functional equivalent of um, the U.S. march from 13 little states on the Atlantic seaboard to the Mississippi River. Um, it would get their living space through military conquest. And so what we have in every society is a class structure. And in that class structure, you have upper classes who generally, an upper class holds the majority of wealth. Um, but the, the global economy is not running as smoothly as it should and profits are always in danger so um here in the united states you can see that profits started to to dip down in the early 70s and the upper class and the, the corporate class i should be more precise the, the, the corporate class began uh, to break the union movement in the united states when i was a kid in 1954, 35% of non-agricultural workers were in a labor union. Today, that figure is 10%. So we've gone from one out of three workers in a labor union with the ability to conduct strikes, compel higher wages and benefits, to a situation where now it's only one in 10 workers are unionized. And if you take public sector workers like teachers and firefighters uh, out of the equation. In the private sector, it's only 
six percent of the workers who are unionized. So the upshot is without any organizational power, the working class has seen their wages uh, fall over a period of a generation. Their benefits have fallen. And although I don't have the references on the top of my head, in the last three years, two different reports have come out estimating the shortage in wages because of the decline of the union movement in the United States. And the low end estimate is that the working class in America over the pet since the mid 70s, mid to late 70s to right up about 2020 has lost $30 billion in wages and benefits. That's a heck of a lot of money. Um, a higher estimate out of the Rand Corporation is 50. And I, uh, so I want to propose that um, what so, happened you is, know, it's a million. Maybe it was maybe true. It was I'd have to go look at my notes. It's a huge figure. But I don't have it right in front of me. But my point is, it's just been a dramatic fall in wages and benefits across the board. And consequently, people start looking for solutions. Some people turn to a racial ideology and they say it's the immigrants that are coming in, they're ruining America. Other people turn to a political ideology and say the problem is private enterprise has done this to us and we need some kind of socialist uh, reorganization of society. What you've, we've seen this in the past. We saw it in the, in the 1870s, 80s, and 90s during what the economists call the Long Depression. Uh, we've seen it in the 1930s. Wherever the working class starts to move left, the upper class starts to move right, and they create um, nationalist propaganda. You could think Fox News was the most obvious example, but I won't let MSNBC off the hook either. You, you have this move to the right. It's not an accident, and it's, it comes out of the upper class, which has the, the, you know, the funding to um, promote these kinds of uh, racist and fascist ideas. And the, the rise of authoritarian regimes around the world is not some kind of mystery. It's, it's what upper classes do when they have a political problem facing them. When their, their working class starts to move left, they get very nervous. They start to move right. And that's the danger that um, we face right now in the um, first quarter of the 20th century. Jeff, you have a hand up. Uh, yeah, first of all, I want to tell anyone who wants to uh, ask a question to raise a hand, go to the bottom of the screen, and you go to the re reactions uh, icon. Under there, there's a place to raise your hand. Uh, <clears throat> I want to go back to Dick and, and ask Dick uh, and follow up on Uri's question. Uh, what should... What should the United States do when the 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 stream of Im immigrants becomes two or three or even ten times what it is today due to global warming? Well, okay, I would have my answer. Uh, I'm, I'm going to make sure I'm on. Okay, uh, rather than sitting back and. Uh, Simply adapting to global warming, the United States needs to take the lead in uh, in making sure that global warming is stopped. I mean, so that's that would be my answer: that we don't deal with the symptoms, we deal with causes. And the uh, there, there's no shortage of uh, practical and theoretical solutions. But I, it, you know, to follow up on what Chuck was saying, you uh, the the best website that I know, or the best writer on this is John Bellamy Foster. He's the editor of the Monthly Review. And he says, as long as you have an economic system that is dependent on continuous expansion, you will have increase in greenhouse gases. So the United States is going to have to take the lead in reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And this is the way that you're going to be able to do it. You can't just deal with symptoms. It's impossible. 
Okay. It's like of, the, of the 40 people on this call, uh, if anyone has a question or wants to ask a question, uh, please, I can't see everybody at once. So you've got to uh, raise One your hand to that reaction button. Victor yeah. has got his hand up. Yeah, Jeff, okay. one person is on her phone, and she would like to uh, ask Victor, two questions. Victor, Jane Kaufman Lacosta. Are you calling on me? Uh, well, I'm calling on Victor first, since but oh, since okay, he must be muted. So, so why don't you go ahead, Maxine? Okay, just uh, I twice put in the chat question. I was really fascinated by the the history of, of all the things that were going on in the U.S. Uh, in the 20s and 30s that I, as a kid growing up in, in San Francisco in the 40s, never heard about, uh, of course. Um, but I'm wondering now, I live in Canada, do the same kinds of processes and policies happen also apply to, uh, also apply to Canada in those days? Uh, Canada, I I can't tell you. What I one thing I do know politically about Canada is it's not a very nice thing. Is uh, <laughs> by way of understatement, it's that um, apparently a lot of the Ukrainian fascists after World War II, instead of winding up in the U.S., wound up for some reason in Canada. Um, where they've had a, a big influence and have tried to export that political influence in, into the United States. Um, the, some of the, the things I've, I've researched about anti-Semitism in the U.S. Um, are backed up by uh, personal stories. You know, uh, being a, raised as an Irish Catholic kid in the West San Fernando Valley, um, and I didn't even know anybody who was a Jew. Um, and uh, that's not until I went to, come to think of it, grad school. But um, I, did, I did work with a guy in uh, LA, LA City Recreation and Parks in the summer. And he, he was, a, I worked as a swim instructor and he was a pool manager. And he was a very he wasn't very tall, but he, he was built like a Mack truck. He's very thick and solid. And uh, on our lunch hours, uh, sometimes you know, uh, he would he would uh, show us that he could do um, a handstand, do a push-up handstand, where he'd lower his head, touch his nose to the floor, and then push himself back up. And that's I've tried it. I tried it back then, fifty years ago, and it's rather difficult. Anyway, I got, I asked him, you know, how did he, was he, was he born with this strength or, or did he see a Charles Atlas ad in a comic book or, or how did he get to be so strong? He said he took up weightlifting. Um, and I said, why? And he said, well, uh, he says, I got tired of, of the, the Gentile kids um, stopping him on the way home. And, um, running their fingers through his hair looking for the horns you know and I said what horns and he says well I you know I'm a Jewish kid and there's you know they thought I was supposed to have horns in my hair and it was years years later um I was talking to an acquaintance I lost track of him over the years but he he ran the radio station at Cal State Northridge he was a Jewish guy and he told me he remembered after World War II, as a little boy going with his parents, apartment hunting in West LA, and he remembered seeing signs on the, on the lawn in front of the apartment building that said, uh, no blacks, no Mexicans, no Jews need apply. This is after World War II. And I was just kind of stunned. I said, when was this? And he says, well, this is the late forties. And, um, uh, you know, I, you know, it's one of those things where you say, I, I, it's hard, it's hard to believe, but, you know, I figured it, he said it, it's, it's true. I had no reason to distrust him. But, okay. Um, we've, okay. We've got four hands up. So okay, Jack, just, Jack, what do you have to say? Can you hear me? Can you yes, hear me? Can. 
Yes, we. Uh, okay, there was a question about what was going on in Canada. So, uh, I mean, I, I'm not an expert, but uh, what I understand is uh, it was very similar. It was a very similar situation. Maybe not, not on the scale, and not not on the intensity as the United States, but uh, similar. But there there were two areas where. I, I would say Canada exceeded the United States in its policy. And one was uh, in immigration on the question of Jewish refugees from 1933 to 19, even after 1945. And it's, it's summed up by a very famous quote from the cabinet minister responsible at the time who was asked how many Jewish refugees would you be willing to take and he said none is too many. So Canada except perhaps for literally a handful during those years did not take any Jewish refugees and the and there's a book written about it and the title comes from that quote none is too many. The book's author is Irving Abella and uh, the second area where you might say Canada exceeded the United States is in the post-war intake of uh, former Nazis and collaborators, uh, which came in under the guise of being anti-communists, which it was true. Uh, they were anti-communists, and that's why they were Nazi collaborators during uh, the war. And it was to such an extent that it's well known that Simon Wiesenthal never stepped foot in Canada because, as he himself said, there are just too many war criminals there uh, under the protection of the government. Uh, by the way, uh, I'd like to recommend a couple of books. One is uh, Michael Chabon uh, wrote a novel titled Moon Glow, which I read, which is a really excellent, it's, it's, it's a, a novel, but it's based on a lot of historical fact. And it's, it's partly about uh, Werner von Braun and who he really was. Uh, Werner von Braun was a former SS officer. And in that novel, Chabon talks about this post-war uh, intake and usage of former Nazis and who, who and how, Werner von Braun's role in the use of slave labor in building the the uh, the V rocket program and how he was rehabilitated by the Americans after the war. Uh, another book I'd, I'd like to recommend there was a mention of. Um, uh, John Rogue and his his work as a prosecutor with the Justice Department. I read a book many years ago, and it was about the the establishment of pre-war cartels between American and German companies. Uh, the thing is that there were German companies who had branches in the United States. And there were American companies who had branches in Germany. And they all saw the war coming and they created strategies to make sure that regardless of which side won, the companies would survive. And, and so they created these uh, cartels. And I don't remember the title of the book. And it, Rogue may have even been the author because I, I remember the author was a very well-informed former American government official. And another thing I want to mention is uh, the tremendous sympathy that existed uh, among uh, Western intellectuals for fascism before the war. Now, I want to qualify by saying that um, a, lot of, a lot of people who were sympathetic to fascism like Wyndham Lewis and, uh, for example, Jessica Mitford's sister, 
they didn't really know what was coming in the way of the Holocaust. So their attitudes, a lot of them changed their attitudes uh, in the course of the war and after. But people like um, King Edward VIII, uh, Charles Lindbergh, and um, uh, there was, I forget, there was a, someone else I was going to mention. They, they uh, had uh, very active, they were very active in, in promoting uh, German fascism. Uh, Edward VIII, to such an extent that, according to uh, a retired MI6 officer I met personally once in Vancouver many, many years ago, who worked on the case uh, during the war, he said to me, the, 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 the myth is that Edward was forced to abdicate because of his wife. Um, uh, the American divorcee, but the reality was his sympathy to German fascism and his active role in promoting it. And that's why in the end, he was shuffled off to be governor of the Bahamas, as close as they could get him to the United States where the Americans would keep an eye on him during the war. Uh, so, um, uh, that's the end of my spiel. Did you have a question, Jack? No, I'm sorry. It, uh, I didn't have a question. I, I just was throwing out my comments. Okay. Let me say, anybody who recommends a book, that's the speakers or Jack or anyone else, if they send it to me within an hour, uh, a, a link or a title of the book within an hour after this session, I will put it in the uh, email that has the links to the recording. <clears throat> I see four hands up, and in the I'm going to call you in this order: Rick, Carol, Jeff, and David. So, Rick, take it away. Oh, thanks, Jeff. Uh, yeah. So, the, you know, I think this was a really good sort of recap of what gets left out when the funding comes from Bank of America. And if you check it out, that's where. Uh, it looks like from the credits that go after every Ken Burns documentary, that's where the uh, lion's share of the funding comes from, uh, but obviously from corporate America. And um, yeah, that's one reason things get left out. But I think you guys are very helpful in pointing out that basically what gets left out are social movements of the left. Um, and it's easy to demonize because they do it themselves, the social movements of the right, namely fascism and so forth. But, um, you know, as Howard Zinn uh, said, you know, it, it's social movements that make history. And uh, we can't conflate as we may have been inadvertently done, you know, the people, the country, the government and social movements because they're all kind of separate dynamics. And I think you're, you're really, your presentation is really good to point out that it was the suppression of social movements which allowed the United States as a country to, shall we say, go soft in some respects pre-war and to some extent uh, during the war. And then obviously after the war to, to go soft on the Nazis. And I believe, and I'd love to hear anything you, either of you know about it, um, that there was, and I don't know this, you know, uh, as a historical fact, but I've heard that it is, that the United States did not bomb um, General Motors or Ford plants in uh, Nazi Germany during the war, which would have shortened the war considerably perhaps. Um, but I think that, that, that where we end up with is what do we do, you know, to to not re, to not allow the same kinds of dynamics to take over? And it seems to me we go back to Joe Hill and say organize. So how do we organize? Well, there's going to be a teacher's strike, I think, tomorrow. I don't get the LA Times, but that's what I've heard. Um, you know, so we need to figure out how to bolster social movements of the left. I'm not saying I know how to do that, 
particularly. I think we all probably know something about how to do that. And I think we need to put our heads together and act. Um, maybe that's redundant because maybe everybody on this call already knows that, but that's my two cents. Thanks. Jeff, can you hear me? Jeff, can you hear me? I left in the 10,000 times and you don't hear no, 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 Victor. Victor, I'll call on you in a minute, but we got three other people whose hands are no, raised. Hi, I'm I'm like... to you know that I let that you see my hand. You see my hand? Hi yes, to you. I see it. I see it now. Okay. Uh, Thank you. We called on you before. Hi, but you. Rick or Chuck, do you have a response to Rick? No, I, th I think what he said was well, well put. And, um, no, I, I would I would say just I would just add that, um, you know, the, the, the topic of the U.S. and the Holocaust and the, the lack of government response, proper government response to the refugees can be quite depressing. But it's also depressing, partly um, because uh, Ken Burns, without saying that this treatment of the of State Department's actions and Roosevelt administration's actions is inaccurate. He just leaves a lot out. He doesn't tell you about these uh, social movements, and he, you know, you get the impression that like half the country is ready to, you know, join the Nazis or welcome the Nazis, when in fact um, that's not true. And uh, you know, there was a broad base. Uh, movement of various leftist organizations ranging from left liberal to communist and you know people were active I, I don't have the title of the book but there's um, th there is a book out about how Jews in LA found out that Nazis were organizing uh, here in LA to basically create out create uh, assassinations of Los Angeles prominent Los Angeles Jews um, and they and the citizen, the Jewish citizens themselves foiled the plot. So these kinds of things happened all, all around uh, the country. Um, but, you know, one of the points that Rick, uh, not Rick, uh, but Dick and I want to, you know, emphasize is that while it was, I think, fairly easy for the U.S. government to get a lot of people to be motivated to be in that war, um, to fight for democracy. I think a lot of soldiers believe that. And, uh, but the fact that many people, the soldiers and their families uh, believed that in democracy um, doesn't mean that the US leadership believed in it. And I, I think a good example of that is, is the experience of black Americans who said, we'll fight in this war, but we remember the last one. We came home from World War I and we, we were treated uh, the way we've always been treated, like second-class citizens. Uh, so our campaign is the double V, victory against fascists abroad, victory against fascists at home. And after serving in the war, they come home and the Klan is lynching them and killing them and bombing their homes and their churches. And they find out they're betrayed. It, it takes, you know, 20 years after World War II to get a Civil Rights Act, a Voting Rights Act, um, and, and to suppress, successfully suppress the Ku Klux Klan. Um, and, and yet, segregation hasn't gone away. Poverty hasn't gone away. It's, but um, so we have to distinguish, as Rick points out, you know, there's what the leadership says and what the people say. Um, if you'll allow me one one moment, Jeff, I want to put in another comment I think is very important. And that is under the uh, heading, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. A saying we get from Ben Franklin. One of the things that I didn't see in the Ken Burns documentary and maybe it was there and I missed it, but I don't recall at all seeing any discussion of an effort to have a collective security arrangement against the Soviet, excuse me, against Nazi Germany. 
Um, the Soviet Union kept proposing that in the 1930s, and the Western powers kept ignoring that proposal. If there had been a collective security pact that would have contained German aggression and given Hitler a clear message, you're not going to war. Um, and we're not going to let you continue with rearmament. So you can't go to war. Um, you wouldn't have had a Holocaust because 95% of the Jews who were killed from countries that were not in were not German or Aust Germany or Austria. I mean, the Holocaust takes place in Poland and the Soviet Union. The death camps are in Poland, um, and the Einsatzgruppen, the, the mobile death squads that followed the the German army into the USSR, um, and killed over a million Jews. I mean, you know, these killings could not have happened without an invasion abroad. So you could have um, prevented a Holocaust if you had prevented a war. But I, I th it's, you might call me too cynical, but I think the, the Western powers were a little hopeful that maybe uh, you, could, you could let Poland go if the Soviet Union can march through and, and destroy this. Uh, yeah, excuse me, if Germany can march through Poland and destroy the Soviet Union. Um, okay. Anyway. Okay, uh, we've got, uh, it's, a quick, quarter, wanna... it's a quarter of, I'm willing to stay as long as everyone wants to, but I want to remind uh, everyone that Carol, Jeff, David, and Victor all have had their hands up and are patiently waiting. So, Dick, can you be brief? Yes, I'll be very brief. I I do know of one particular case of American companies that intervened to make sure that their factories were not harmed. That was the firebombing of Dresden. And if you read about it, you'll see, you'll see that it had very little impact on German war production. The reason is that the, 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 the flyers and their, and their incendiary bombs were told not to bomb certain factories. And those were factories that were owned by American companies. So they played a big role right through the war and making sure that some of their assets were protected. As for the other part, I'll, uh, we can, that's more for open discussion of the best way to organize. I have a lot of thoughts on it, but I'll shut up. Okay. I can't, you, uh, you've muted, are you, you call me? Okay, a few quick points. First about the horns, that's, uh, that's, goes back to at least the Middle Ages, a mistranslation of the Old Testament, where when Moses comes down from Mount Sinai with the Ten Commandments, he shown rays of light were coming from his head and rays got mistranslated in the Middle Ages, maybe earlier, to horns. And if you look at the statue of Moses, reproduction of Michelangelo's Moses that's in in, in Rome, there are horns on on out of the on Moses' head right outside Cedar Sinai. The, the hospital. So that's that's with the horns, and a lot of people took it literally and believe that. Um, the the second point about what the Dick saw that signs that said no Mexicans, no blacks, no Jews, and I don't think they used the word blacks. I'm sure it was worse than that. Um, uh, those were actually being produced, but not 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 signs. Um, eight and a half by eleven Xerox were being produced in Southern California as the center of white supremacist graphics in the late 1990s. And, and they were being put in the lockers of, of Mexican and black kids. I don't know if they were put in lockers of Jewish kids, but definitely um, black and Mexican kids all over. And the, they were recruiting posters and they were um, intimidation posters. And their phone numbers on them were 714-213-805. And I got these from Atlanta. And they were collecting them and they said the center was in Southern California. Um, third point, uh, the, the, the book that Chuck mentioned is by Steve Ross and it's called Hitler in Los Angeles. Quite, quite incredible. Um, I was really happy to hear that, that when uh, Rick um, mentioned that uh, Burns, Ken Burns does not uh, leaves out social movements. It really shouldn't be a surprise anyone who's seen his Vietnam series, you would not know that there was an anti-war movement that wasn't self-centered and and just you know kind of disgusting. It was it was quite a horrible um, a horrible series, a horrible moving for the for the for the vets who 
who, who came out against the war, but absolutely despicable about the anti-war movement uh, in itself. So it's, it's not surprising he doesn't mention the Communist Party or any kind of grassroots organizing. And um, and finally, but I want to say one one positive thing about the Ken Burns, I, Ken Burns is that I was raised, my, my father left Germany in the 30s. My grandparents got out very late. My mother had always taught me if Roosevelt had known what the Nazis were doing, he, he would have gotten involved sooner. And and I, I knew this was a lie because I have art from the early 40s by American and Mexican artists that show what the Nazis were doing. But the fact that Ken Burns documented is really well, I thought, how 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 deeply in the US government they knew and how they wanted the Soviets destroyed. They didn't, and plus, plus anti-Semitism just prevented them from, from getting involved. So the fact that that, that was at least a, a positive thing, um, they, they put a lie to what my, the lie that my mother believed and many other people. Thank you. Uh, Dick or Chuck, do you have a quick response to Carol? Uh, well, I'll simply say uh, the part of the uh, of the of the series that was good was when uh, a, the Polish government in exile sent someone who had actually been in the Warsaw Ghetto. His name was Jan Karski, I think, it was Jan Karski, who was interviewed directly as an older man, and he confirmed that he had had a direct meeting with uh, Roosevelt and explained exactly what was going on in the killing centers and in the ghettos. So Roosevelt had direct knowledge. So that's the, that. That's one of the positive things about the documentary. Okay. I'll, I'll let, uh, I'll just add a quick, quick comment. If you watch the Ken Burns documentary, he will say that, it, you know, in the end, the United States eventually did accept about almost 200,000 Jewish refugees and did more than any other country. But if you go out and, and get the historical research on the subject of refugees, uh, what you will find is that actually the uh, Soviet Union evacuated one and a half million Jews uh, far enough to east where the German army couldn't get to them. And uh, a number of people in the 40s said we you know we got to remember that the soviet union whatever you think of it uh, did the most saved the most jews from from the nazis and ken burns admits that entirely uh except for the part where he says two hundred thousand polish jews were taken into the soviet union and then sent to kazakhstan and he, he, he i think he uses the word repression uh it was no picnic to be in the soviet union but um, it was better than the alternative. But there's a you know, anti-leftist bias in the Ken Burns films, and, and um, okay, I'll okay. let you go. Jeff Cooper. Yeah, I just I want to respond just uh, very quickly to what something Chuck said earlier because it brought back a lot of really bad memories. I grew up in the in the Western San Fernando Valley from 1949 till you know the, the late 50s. And and I had the shit beat out of me a couple of times. I thought I was going to die because it was there was always a group that would attack me, and a group and they would sit on my you know I once I'm on the ground they'd sit on my stomach and I couldn't breathe I couldn't breathe in and I couldn't breathe out and I really thought I was going to die. They beat up my sister uh, because we were Jewish, and and the the anti Jewishness in because there weren't that many Jews that we we knew in this, the Western San Fernando Valley in 1950, 51, 52. Uh, and the, the anti-black uh, uh, or the anti, the niggers and, and the, the, the Mexicans and the Spics and, and the, the anti-Asian and anti-native, uh, that Native Americans, uh, it, was all, it was all there and there were signs. And I had a, a close friend who was a, a, a Alaskan Eskimo uh, descent and what we used to hear all kinds of of, of anti uh, uh, Semitic comments, uh, and he used to look at me like, "How come you're not responding?" And I told him later, "If I respond, they'll shut up. I want to hear what they have to say." And it, it was um, it was incredible, all the the things you know that uh, that we heard. Um, 
So I and I never ever found other Jewish people who as as, as an adult uh in the late 50s and in 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 this in, in in the 60s who who were from LA, who were from the San Fernando Valley, who knew any of this, because most of them had grown up in the Fairfax area. They'd grown up around other in the Jewish communities. And and we were isolated out there. And and like I said, there were there were signs and anti-Semitic signs and anti almost every group. Um, and they, they attacked the uh, Encino Park had it there was a, a Native American who was the one who was in charge of uh, the caretaker for the park. And and he was attacked uh, as as a Native American. So and and that's kind of, that is what what made me the kind of adult, the political activist that I became. And I we my sister and I were both afraid to tell our parents that we'd been beat up, you know, by these 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 young people who were always like I said they there was never one on one. It was always like four or five against one. Anyway, that's all I I just I just I don't know how many of you are from L.A. From, from I'm I'm over eighty, so I mean I don't know how many from the late, late uh, 1949 to the early 50s, but that's what we experienced out there then. Thank okay, you. Okay, thank you, thank you, Jeff. And I want to just comment that I grew up in a in a, in a mostly Christian neighborhood that was only about 10% uh, Jewish in Queens, and I didn't have any of that. None, 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 none. Anyway, David Cohn, you're next. So this is actually his wife, Carol Hamilton. Uh, David is here as well. It's, it's, I have a it's question. possible to change the name. <laughs> well, I, I'm on his iPad. So I was on the phone before, but I, anyway, I'm on his iPad, but that's okay. Uh, but I have a question and a comment. Um, first, I just wanted to say, because Dick went through a few of the genocides and I did want to bring to your attention because it often is forgotten about that Tibet was, uh, noted as the worst genocide back in 1960. So much has happened since then, but in 1960, is it something I said? No, um, no. <laughs> uh, anyway, the, Tibet was in 1960, Tibet was considered the worst genocide since the Holocaust. That was in 1960, much has happened since then. So just want people to remember Tibet as well. And then I, I had a question, and I'm not sure who said this, but I had a question about the statement that, uh, you know, when when the labor movement moves to the left, the corporate class, you know, goes to the right and accelerates their propaganda. And my question is about the current state of affairs, because, I mean, I don't know the numbers or the percentages. I'm sure all of you probably know more specifically about that than I, but... It seems to me that the right, I mean, pardon me, that the labor, much of the labor, I don't want to say the labor movement, but but workers, that many workers in today's world um, have been unfortunately uh, misinformed. They're, you know, Fox News watchers and, you know, are probably very right wing. So I, I it seems that the workers, maybe not the labor movement, but the workers are actually somewhat right wing and in fact, not moving to the left. So that's my question about that. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I'll make, I'll make a comment and I'll try to keep it quick, Jeff. Um, that there, there is, that, that's the whole point of the right wing ideology is to take some of those workers and move them to the right. And, you know, basically what you have is a struggle between two kinds of ideologies, nationalism versus class consciousness. You either see the society as having a class structure with an upper class exploiting a working class, if I can basically get right down to the nuts and bolts of it, or you have a nation where we're all one big community, except for the people who are here who aren't really members of the nation and should be deported or at least know their, their second class status. They should know their place. And so the fascists always try to create a national community. You notice the Nazis were basically national socialists. Socialists, they'll have something for everybody. Everybody will be taken care of, but it's only for members of the nation and if you're not a member of the nation, such as the Jews, for example, then you don't belong here. You're not, you can't be part of our community. 
And so you have these conflicting ideologies and the fascists try very hard to pull people in the working class to the right to use them against those in the working class who move to the left. And then of course you have a whole mass of people who are just indifferent. Um, they come home, they're, they're tired from work and they, they turn on the TV, watch a movie and they veg out and they, they just don't want to think anymore. Um, so it's, but there's a lot of movement towards the left, but the left is workers on the left side are in a very weak position. And, um, you know, it's, it's a difficult situation. But I'm out of here. Not out of here, I'm just muting. Okay, Victor. Victor, you're. Uh... Yeah. Before, before I start, can I ask you? Can I? Yeah. Yeah, I'm okay. here. I have one question. I would like to meet Rachel Sin. I saw her here. Where is Rachel Sin? I saw her in the picture. One second. She got a Cuban flag hanging on the wall. Rachel Sin. S E N E. Sin. Rachel Sin. Her she husband just her. went to get her. A, a lot of people have dropped out, Victor. So oh, she's coming. She's coming. She's coming. We're both here. Oh. <laughs> okay. This man is lost again. He's asking me. Uh, I saw a Cuban flag. Rachel. Yes. yes. I saw a Cuban flag. Oh, I see. Did Where you. did you get it? Where did you get the flag? In Cuba. You're in Cuba? When we were in Cuba on a trip to Cuba, the Cuban exchange, we Cuba bought myself. it at the airport. I mean, you're sick one. I, I'm in Cuba. I'm born in Cuba. He was born in Cuba. Wow. Victor Kozatsky. Wonderful. Oh, uh, you can also get it on Amazon. <laughs> okay. Just a little. Okay. Uh, thank you. Now I know where you're going. Uh, right. yeah, let's continue. Yep. Let's continue. Yep. Yep. Can I say what I want to say? Can you hear me, Jeff? You've got the floor, Victor. Yes, we hear you. Okay, um, I would like to add the fascist organization that was created in Germany. In actuality, it was created in the United States by the, by the Rockefeller Foundation and Ford Foundation with the help of Mengele. If you want to know the real, we could not, they could not create what they call it the perfect society in the United States. So they created, they tried, they did, but it didn't work out. So Mengele decided to go to Germany, that the best place where he can create it, and he did it over there. He did it very well over there. Did a good job over there. And besides that, we have to take also in consideration that the Zionist organization also helped in that fact. They were sending Jews from Germany, if they can afford to pay 1,000 lira sterling, Lira Sterling, because the England was in charge of Palestine on those days. They would not allow them to come unless they have 1,000 Lira Sterling. So they let them go over there, up a closer to 6,000 Jewish, Jewish young generation, and with tools, tractors, German tractors, with seeds and everything to produce for the German army. A orange, citrus, and all kind of food that they needed for the German. They worked until 1943, when the oppression of the ghetto Russia started and was all over the world, so everything stopped. And that is a fact. What did not stop with German and the United States was the A IBM computers. Did not stop from the beginning to the end. And they were still paying monthly payment to the American, to the American IBM, and that is a fact. They didn't sell the patent; they just rented it, the, 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 the service, and they get a good job for the crematorium to send people for, for, from from land to land and to find out who, when they conquer Jewish, they, when they conquer land in other countries, they knew at the beginning who is a Jew and who is not a Jew, based on the IBM because they gave them all the information. 
They already know before they conquer any land in Europe who is a Jew and who is not a Jew. And that is a fact. We are responsible. We, if we don't take responsibility for fascism today in the world, fascism exists today. And they're fighting fascism one way or another. So we have to take a decision. We continue doing what we're doing, talking to each other, or we take a step and we say we have to stop. <laughs> That's a fact. Uh, do you ever respond? Uh, yes, uh, uh, okay. uh, Give me one I second. We, uh, we, a lot of people misunderstand fascism. They think that fascism is somehow Nazism. Any, any country could be, have a fascist movement. And fascism has two features. One is the political repression, especially of the uh, socialist communist parties and trade unions. The other is war. All fascist governments go to war. And that's why uh, this was a, a part an answer to Rick's question from earlier. <clears throat> I think for people who are persuaded that well, fascism is just domestic repression. It's just like Trumpism. Therefore, you need to support uh, Biden and the Democrats. This is, a, this is an, uh, a poor response because Biden and the Democrats represent another part of fascism that drive towards war, even more than the Republicans. So you have to, you have, to have a good understanding of fascism. And it's, uh, the fact that Israel is moving towards in a fascist direction, the United States is moving in a fascist direction, Britain, Germany, most of Western Europe is moving in a fascist direction. It's something that we need to be totally aware of at this point and not think that it's just the resurrection of Nazism. Okay. Alex and Arlene have their hand up, but before I call on them, because it's the end of the hour, I want to share uh, uh, what's coming up. So next, next month, April 17th, starting an hour early, is Tariq uh, Kenny Shawa, who's going to be talking about, he, he works for a uh, Palestinian uh, NGO in New York. He's going to be talking about challenging anti-boycott legislation in the U.S. And he's coming from the East Coast. That's why we're going an hour early. The following month and the third Monday is Alan Burstein, who's an Israeli who study at the Hebrew University, who, who is spending a month, uh, excuse me, a year at UCI. He studies terrorism, and he's going to be talking about what drives terrorism. And he, terrorism, and he has very interesting observations about the more religious a terrorism group is, the more, it acts differently. A month beyond that, uh, on June 19th, again coming from the East Coast, so an hour early, and this is not quite firmed up yet, but it looks pretty close, is Michael Omerman. Uh, and he's going to update an article he wrote a couple of months ago called Israel. Uh, and he's going to be talking about Israel's fight for democracy. Uh, so I hope all you people come back and, uh, and for these three uh, Zooms that are coming up. Uh, so. <coughs> I want to now call on Alex, and after Alex will be Arlene, and I'll stay as long as uh, Dick and Chuck will stay. But before I give it to you, Alex, let me just say something to Jeff. When I said that I came from a neighborhood in Queens that was a Christian neighborhood, very few Jews, and I wasn't beat up, I wasn't doubting anything you said. I'm just commenting on the difference in the anti-Semitism between Los Angeles and Queens. That that was my comment. Uh, so Alex, it's your floor. Uh, you're muted, Alex. You're muted. You're still muted. You're still muted. Uh, okay. okay. I'm talking from the East Coast, by the way. <laughs> um. I, I just wanted to make a, a one comment um, that was uh, related to the world, to the, um, the comment that was made earlier about um, uh, uh, the rays and horn, right? The confusion between the, the two, but the speaker 
the woman, I, I, I forgot her name. She didn't. Carol Wells, she's anything. an art historian. Uh, huh? Her name is Carol Wells and she's an art okay, historian. Okay, so Carol did not say that in Hebrew, the, the words Ray and Horon are the same word, Karen, and hence the confusion. In Hebrew, it's, it's, one, it's the same word. Anyway, but that's not the important thing that I wanted to say. If I understand correctly, um, Ken Burns um, dealt primarily with the question why the US did not provide uh, more help to, to Jews, to refugees, did not bring more here. Then came also the question about the bombardment of, the, um, of Auschwitz and the railways and a few other things. Now, th th those are uh, old questions. Uh, that were, you know, dealt with uh, many historians that um, were dealing with the Holocaust, Holocaust experts. And usually the answer that is given is um, anti-Semitism, uh, hatred to, for the Jews, indifference, and so on and so forth. But, you know, my, my question is, the U.S. did not enter the war in order to help any refugees and any Jews. The U.S entered the war late, to begin with late, when Europe was already completely burning. It entered to the war, as everybody knows, uh, two years and three months uh, after the war began. And it didn't enter the war in order to save Jews or refugees in general. It never enters any war in order to save anybody, as far as, far as I'm concerned. It enters because it was attacked in Pearl Harbor, Germany and Italy declared war, and the idea was to fight <coughs> countries and, you know, vanquish them. And as was also pointed out in the, in the, in Ken Burns' uh, uh, film, it, you know, when, the sooner you beat the Nazis, uh, the sooner the Holocaust uh, and the whole uh, issue of the refugees will be solved. So why do we, so my question is, why is the question even raised? Why is the question of um, why the U.S. did not help the Jews or did not bring more of them here? This this was not the 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 the, the role or, or this was not the purpose of the Americans. And the other the other point that I want to make is when we ask this question, why the United States did not do more for the Jews or for refugees? Don't we assume? that the US is a good power, is a good country. It, 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 you know, it helps people, right? I mean, when we ask this question, why they didn't do more? <laughs> but it, you know, that, that's not the case. The US does not enter any war, whether it's Vietnam or anywhere, to help anybody except its interests as it is understood by the government and by, the, by the, those who are in power. So why do we even talk about why the U.S. did not help the Jews? You see my question? You see my point? That's all what I have to say. Dick, maybe you can answer. Well, Dick? there's a few things that have come to come to mind. Uh, the, the first, the first thing is, you know, when the war ended in Germany, the people, the the, the people who were in the camps were not released. And the general, the German, the American general who was put in charge of the occupation of Germany, this is law, so this was uh, General Patton. And Patton, it turns out by his uh, memoirs or by his diary, was a flaming anti-Semite. He put Nazis in charge of the, of the Jews who were stuck in these camps. There were about 200,000 of them. So I, <clears throat> in other words, there, there, it wasn't just pursuing national interest, which means ruling class interest. There was anti-Semitism that, that guided US policy through about 1952. Uh, and uh, if you look at the Emanuel Sellers legislation through 1965, when the national origins thing, so bigot, bigotry was a big part of what formed the US policy. It wasn't just pursuit of national interest. There was clear, clear, clearly a lot of bigotry that guided US policy. The U.S. entered the war because it was attacked. It didn't enter the, US, the war. The U.S. was preparing for war long before then. And even Ken Burns makes the point that, that Roosevelt, was, Roosevelt was interested 
in <clears throat> the right moment politically to do it. And, it, and he, he was very aware of what was going on with the Holocaust. Excuse me, I can't talk very well. <clears throat> but he had a standard answer, which you, which you repeated and Ken Burns repeated, which is, well, the best way we can help the, pe the people who are being slaughtered by the Nazis is to win the war. That was a standard answer. But it didn't make any difference for the Jews because five of the six million Jews were already uh, already assassinated, where they were executed by the by uh, by the day. They were, I mean, by the time the U.S. took action uh, to help the refugees, which was 1944, most of the Holocaust had taken place. So those are my thoughts. Okay, uh, Arlene. Okay, can you hear me? I just mm -hmm. unmuted. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so I just wanted to say again, I'm not refuting anything that the person uh, who said there was a lot of anti Semitism in the San Fernando Valley. Uh, I grew up in East LA and I went to Roosevelt High School in the 50s. And um, Amazingly enough, it was an extremely integrated school, and I did belong to a leftist group at the time, and I personally never felt any anti-Semitism in the high school. Um, there were a lot of Mexicans, there were a lot of Jews, there were white Russians, there were not too many Blacks, and there were some people, and there were some people from Japan who had been in the camps, yeah, but just to, I just didn't feel any anti-Semitism. So I guess there was, but it wasn't everywhere. <laughs> and yeah. the, other, the other thing I wanted to say, so, someone <laughs> mentioned that if there would have been an alliance between the Soviet Union and the US, that maybe there wouldn't have been, could have prevented the Holocaust. So I'm just wondering if anyone thinks that the alliance is now against Putin, is that a good thing? Is that preventing uh, a lot, slaughter of a lot of people? It's sort of, to me, it's kind of a parallel thing of what the other person said. And the last thing I'm gonna say is this, is, this isn't the time for, that, for this discussion. But uh, since Dix said that Israel is an apartheid, apartheid state, I would challenge that. So I'm probably a very different belief than a lot of people who are on the Zoom call. Well, uh, I'll respond. The reason I say Israel is an apartheid state is because 5 million people are living under military occupation without the right to vote. You have a government that says uh, that they're not going to change that through a Palestinian state. This is right, but we would have this to go a, much more into this to say what is an what constitutes well, look, an apartheid. Uh, all I'm saying so, is, to me, it looks like apartheid. I've spent a lot of time in South Africa. I don't see any difference between the well, two. In fact, people from South Africa say that the apartheid that has developed in Israel is worse than South Africa. But okay. any, uh, I, I so would counter that. that, but this isn't the right time to say it. Yeah, I would. I have a lot of things that I would say that count that but that's not what, what we're discussing now so but since you made the comment I just wanted to say that I have a different outlook on it well I think the point about Israel though is a good one because if we're talking about U.S. foreign policy and lessons that it should have learned from World War II and the Holocaust oh uh, if you, you wouldn't be supporting a government that keeps five million people under military occupation and separation you wouldn't there's a lot more to that than what you're saying okay, I, I, that's my opinion you wouldn't yeah. you wouldn't you wouldn't give four billion dollars a year in weaponry to a government like yeah. Israel. Not, not too much more complicated this, this, yeah i don't support the, the government now i mean i certainly don't support netanyahu but i know what you're saying is way be, beyond that it has nothing so yeah, much to do with that. Someone whose son-in-law is a Palestinian from Israel and whose wife is from Israel and who has spent a lot of time in Israel. I've seen it up close. I'm not speaking abstractly from someone who lives in the United States. 
Well, neither am I. I spent three years. I lived in Israel on a kibbutz and I left this kibbutz. So. I was there recently. My son so. just left. Uh, yeah, let's let's move let's move on. Uh, this uh, it, Tony, did you have your hand up? I did just to just to invite Arlene to come in when when Michael Omerman gives a presentation. Um, and if you look up um, under the the website for Dawn, Democracy for the Arab World Now, you'll see uh, the, the public paper that um, Dawn has released, uh, which is a summary of the arguments that they made against what's going on in Israel right now. And, um, and it's, it's very clear from that, that you'll, you'll see a counter to your position. So I invite you to be very strongly to come back and and visit with us in June. Well, uh, maybe I will, but I would also like to to recommend the book, which is very different than than the people probably would read on this um, on this call. And it's called Israel: A Simple Guide to the Most Misunderstood Country on Earth, and it's written by Noah Tishbe. So that's my recommendation for a book. As, as I've told you, anybody who has a recommendation for a book, they should email me that and I will put it on the email uh, for the recording. Yossi, Thank I you. saw your hand up. Yeah, I, I, because I heard the last discussion, because I'm originally from Israel, and I had the family in the kibbutzim, and I want to tell you that most of the kibbutzim in Israel who consider themselves socialists, refused to accept Arabs, Israeli citizens, as a member because they were Arabs. This is a reality that exists in Israel almost until today. When you come to the West Bank, you know that Israel building Jewish settlements, but those Jewish settlements is for Jews only. How do you get a call a settlements or, or towns in the United States and they'll say it's for white people only. White people only, and non-white cannot live there because of the race. What are you gonna call this kind of a system where the roads in the West Bank built just for the settlers and the Palestinians not allowed to go on those roads, not allowed. This is part of the system they built there. So what are you gonna call this system? And this is exist. The people they are living under military rule. The Israeli law do not apply to the Palestinians. And military rule, and say that those people you cannot be citizen of Israel. You cannot be citizen of any country. No national rights. No civil rights. What kind of a system? They cannot vote. The the Israeli Jews and Arabs who live in Israel can vote and decide what's happening in the West Bank and the people who live there have no rights to say anything about their future. So what are you gonna call this system? What, you have any name for this system? Look, I would say that, we're, that Israel isn't a perfect country and there are a lot of things that so go South on. That also was not That perfect. shouldn't go on. But, I would was agree. An apartheid system. I, I would say that, but on the other hand, you mentioned what would the United States say if you couldn't, if, if certain people couldn't go on certain roads? What would the United States say if there was a country on their border that started several wars to try to destroy them? And also, besides that, s sends rockets into their country. So you made that uh, comparison, and that's why I'm refuting it and saying, you know, we shouldn't really let, be talking let, about let, let, this. Let, let me let, 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 let me break this. We, 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 it's it's well after uh, uh, nine o'clock. We've gone on for an hour and twenty minutes. I'll stay here as long as we keep talking about uh, Ken Burns's book, uh, film or the Holocaust. Uh, let me say though, there's been so much interest uh, in this subject. We had 53 uh, participants earlier. It's down to 23 now. Uh, if anyone, uh, we, we might do a sort of a follow-on discussion of the Holocaust. 
uh, and anybody who has suggestions on how we might focus it or who might be the leader of it, please email me and I'll try to uh, develop something based on that. Uh, so let me ask before we close out again, are there any other questions? In that case, I want to thank our speakers, uh, Chuck O'Connell, uh, Dick Platt, they both did a, a, a superb job. And I want to thank all you people who came and joined us this evening. Uh, we're going, uh, this has been recorded. Uh, the, re the email with the links to the recording will be out in a couple of hours if I can stay up, maybe uh, early to by noon tomorrow, certainly by noon tomorrow, very likely by midnight tonight. Mm -hmm. uh, Jeff, did you have your hand up to say something or were you just waving goodbye? Just goodbye. Okay. Yeah, just, so just goodbye. waving goodbye. Bye, Jeff Cooper. Bye, Dick Clackin. Bye, Chuck O'Connell. Bye, Victor. Bye, everybody. Bye, Rusty. Bye, everybody. Bye, bye. Bye, thank everybody. You. Thank you. Bye, Rick. Bye, Dina. How about bye, Arlene? Well, I think. Am I still? I think I. Okay, I'm guys. Yes, yes, you still are on, Arlene. Yeah. Jeff, talk to you later. See you, Tony. Thank you. You're welcome. Sorry, we got we got late. We got sidelined, un unfortunately. Yeah. And and my uh, <clears throat> uh, getting started, we had a lot of trouble. So I thank you all, and I wish you all good night. <laughs>